This programme is brought to you by UCL, London's global university. Now, so what I want to do today is to tell you a bit about uh, really the search for gravitational waves. Now, Newton, when developing his law of gravitation, predicted that there should be instantaneous action at a distance. So that no matter what happened in the universe, you'd expect to know this instantaneously. Then when special relativity came along with Einstein, of, co of course it became clear that you can't transfer information at faster than the speed of light. So therefore, instantaneous action to distance is really not possible. And there must be some way, in fact, to transmit gravitational effects through the universe at a finite speed. And if you follow the analog, of course, of, of Maxwell's equations, there must, you would expect, be some sort of equations that will generate some sort of wave motion or radiation, equivalent to electromagnetic waves, but in the gravitational sense. And of course, it took in general relativity, in fact, to, to, um, to give us a picture of this. And it was in 1916 that from general relativity, it became possible to develop a wave equation if you used the right gauge, in fact, to do it in. If you did your general relativity in a, tra in a, a transverse traceless gauge, you could derive a simple wave equation. So gravitational waves should exist. The problem is if you, in other gauges, in, in other transformations, they didn't so obviously exist. And Eddington at that time, or shortly afterwards, rather thought that gravitational waves could be, could be kind of transformed away at the speed of thought, and that people should not waste their time thinking about them, or even thinking there was any, any possibilities of detecting such things. Now, effectively, this uh, situation continued right through the 1920s, the 1930s, in fact, till about the 1950s, when Joseph Weber um, at the University of Maryland, together with John Wheeler, began to get interested in looking for gravitational waves again. And in 1957, they published a paper about the reality of gravitational waves. And that was the first paper, in fact, that suggested that really there was anything real about gravitational radiation. Now, Weber went on to write a book, in fact, about uh, general relativity and gravitational waves, which came out in 1961, and there's a Dover edition of that has been republished, and it's very interesting to revisit it and look at it, because clearly he was trying to persuade people that there was something worthwhile to do here. And uh, I'd recommend anyone who's interested in the field certainly to look at that book, and we'll see, talk about Weber again. The problem, of course, for many of us, particularly experimental people about general relativity, is that you can write and produce many, many, many equations, fill blackboard after blackboard with equations, and not be much the wiser about what's happening. But if, on the other hand, you follow Einstein and take a geometrical approach to, to general relativity, where mass curves space-time, then it becomes clear that what gravitational waves are, are ripples on space-time. And in fact, if you think in two dimensions, if you let one of the kind of four dimensions go and think that you're a little two-dimensional insect on a flat space-time surface or on a curved space-time surface, what you'll feel is, with a gravitational wave passing as a ripple passes, what you'll feel is a fluctuating strain in space. And the amplitude of that strain, or the, what we call the amplitude, is just really the value of the strain. So the amplitude of the gravitational waves you can think as, of, as being the amplitude of a strain in space. Now, it's not surprising that it's a strain you're dealing with, because gravity is like that. Gravity causes tidal effects. Tidal effects are strains. And what we have here is a fluctuating tidal effect that, that will be running on, on, on the kind of rubber sheet that you might think is representing space-time. Now, what sort of sources, in fact, will generate gravitational waves? Well, it turns out that, um, that because mass has only one sign, that gravitational waves are different from electromagnetic waves. 
You can get dipole radiation in electromagnetic waves because as positive charge moves one way, negative charge can move the other way, like in a radio aerial. And you can effectively set up a fluctuating dipole. When mass is only one sign, you can't set up a dipole. All you can do, the first thing you can do is to set up a quadrupole. And so gravitational waves have to be quadrupolar in nature. Now that means they also carry more angular momentum than electromagnetic waves. The graviton, the equivalent particle of, of, of the, you know, that's equivalent to the photon, will carry two units of angular momentum rather than one. And because it's a quadrupolar effect, it means that any sort of generator or transmitter of gravitational waves has to have a fluctuating or changing quadrupole moment. And in fact, there are many uh, examples in the universe where you get this happening. Another thing I should say is that because of the fact that gravity is very weak, it means that gravitational radiation tends to be very weak also. And that this means that you really cannot make a big enough changing quadrupole moment on Earth to, to generate significant gravitational radiation. You do have to look out into the universe. And the most obvious things to look at are to look for pulse gravitational waves. And um, I mean, a good example of a changing quadrupole moment that will lead to pulsed gravitational radiation are two binary stars coalescing, where the stars rotate round each other like this. And as, as they radiate, they lose angular momentum and uh, they effectively lose energy. And that means that the orbit speeds up the orbit gets faster and faster, and you'll see this is indeed happening. And if the stars are compact stars, like neutron stars or black holes, they can get very close together. And as they get very close together, they're actually going pretty fast. And what you expect to get is a chirrup of gravitational radiation before the two stars effectively merge together, perhaps either to form another neutron star or a black hole. Also, you can expect that, you, that as stars collapse, you may also, if in fact you've got an asymmetric situation, so there's again a changing quadrupole moment, you could expect to get gravitational radiation produced. And a typical situation where you get stellar collapses are, is, is, is when you have a uh, supernova explosion. And um, you know, you've got a star that's, that's perhaps very large. Um, it's getting so big that, it's, that, the, that, that the radiation pressure can't withstand the inward pull of gravity, and you get some sort of collapse taking place, where typically the inside collapses while the outer envelope blows off. And if you watch here in the center, you'll see that as the outer envelope gets larger and a collapse takes place, there's a little object left in the center there, a little collapsed object that may be a neutron star or a black hole. And during that collapse process, if it, is asymm if it is asymmetrical, you expect to get significant gravitational radiation coming off. Now, another type of source um, that, that will give gravitational waves uh, is a pulsar. In a typical pulsar, that's a rotating neutron star, um, you tend to find that the axis of rotation and the axis of the magnetic field aren't coincident. And the net effect is that in a typical pulsar, you get a bulge formed, and that bulge, as it rotates round and round, will, will produce a changing quadrupole moment, and so you should get radiation. Similarly, from low-mass X-ray binaries, you expect radiation. And also in neutron stars, again, with a rotating neutron star, there are a lot of models of the kind of you might say that the material physics of it, the equation of state of the material, that suggests that you should get instabilities in the surface and, not, and modes, sort of waves that run round the surface, causing changes of shape, and you'd expect to continuous waves from these. And then, as in electromagnetic astronomy, you would expect there will be some sort of background that came from the early universe. Now this background may be due to the, it may be the same as a microwave background, but a gravitational variant of it, which has been inflated during the inflation era. Or it may be a background that is due to just many, many sources. You know, many supernovae, many um, black, <coughs> coalescences of this sort of type. Or in fact, if you believe in cosmic strings, it may be due to uh, a kind of background of cosmic strings that may exist. Because it's thought that if cosmic strings do exist, it is likely that they will be like violin strings and will effectively be vibrating all the time. 
and will be radiating gravitational waves. In fact, with pulses also coming from them as the ends of the string whip, just as the way a mechanical wave in a, in a whip causes a crack coming from the end, you expect the same sort of thing from cosmic strings if you believe they exist. Of course, that's a question. Now, there's quite a lot of science can be done with gravitational waves. They are of quite considerable cosmological importance. Um, now, first of all, in the fundamental physics of, of the situation, the sort of things that we're interested in are what are the properties of these waves? Is general relativity the correct theory of gravity, for example? Because the curious thing about general relativity is that almost all predictions of general relativity have been tested and nothing has really been found that disagrees with Einstein's original theory, which is quite remarkable. Maybe there's a caveat there. Maybe you would say that the current belief in dark energy or the current suggestion that dark energy exists and the universe is expanding faster or is accelerating faster than you would expect as you go further out. That might suggest that something's wrong with general relativity. I think that's the only instance that anyone has found where you might question Einstein. And even there, you might say it just needs a different cosmological constant putting into, put into the field equations. But in fact, gravitational waves are one prediction that has not been directly tested. And so therefore, it, is, it will be very interesting to test and see if like the speed of the radiation or the speed of the waves is just as Einstein would have predicted or not. It's not clear if general relativity is valid under very strong field conditions. This again is, that again is not really very testable when fields get very, very strong and you've got a very nonlinear situation, you know, where the gravitational field itself generates more gravity. That, that needs tested. And because gravitational waves will be produced mostly where there's very strong gravity, very strong accelerations, that's where you would expect something to show up in the gravitational wave signals when the, the fields get very, very strong. Again, I think there's no doubt now that people believe black holes exist, and it will be very interesting to check, again, from the form of the gravitational wave signals, whether the, the black holes that actually exist in nature are those that are produced or are, are those that are predicted by general relativity, and I mean, there's quite a lot of work to be done in, in, in simulating, you know, the effects of care black holes being formed and whether do black holes have hair, et cetera, associated with them. And also, from the neutron star work, you should be able to get, get some information about how matter behaves under the extremes of density and pressure. But another area that detection of gravitational waves is going to be very interesting in is in cosmology. Because, I mean, clearly, there is something strange about the universe that it is accelerating so rapidly now, um, or, you know, f far out. And, I mean, essentially, this, uh, the evidence for dark energy comes from, I suppose, it's really using supernovae as standard candles, and therefore seeing that the outer parts seem to be accelerating very, very strongly. From gravitational wave signals from coalescing neutron star binaries, there's a remarkable property of these binaries that in the weak field regime, when the fields aren't too strong, you can show really from just an extension of Newtonian gravity that the strength of the signal on Earth and the rate at which it is evolving, the rate at which the chirp takes place, that between these two, from these two things, you can work out precisely how far away the neutron star, neutron star binary is. So in fact, you do have really a standard siren produced. And if you can associate the, the coalescence with perhaps, for instance, a gamma ray burst or something like that, you should be able to then, by measuring an equivalent electromagnetic signal at that distance, get an independent measure of the acceleration of the universe. Now in early days, I mean, people did wonder where the hell it all came from, and I'm afraid now we're still wondering the same thing, what's going on out there in the universe. And I think there's no doubt that the detection of gravitational radiation will help resolve the present problems in cosmology. 
further from looking at the kind of stochastic background of gravitational waves that will be produced and the spectrum of it, it should be possible to get information about the, the phase transitions in the early universe and to get some feeling for, for inflation as it may or may not have taken place. Again, in astronomy and astrophysics, there's quite a bit of information to be got, much bit related to black holes. I mean, we really don't know if stellar mass black holes exist or not, so there's not very good evidence for them. But, I mean, this will tell us, in fact, how abundant stellar mass black holes are if we can see coalescences involving them. Gamma ray bursts, I think there is quite a reasonable belief just now that, that fast gamma ray bursts may be neutron star black hole coalescences ideal sources of gravitational waves and so be very testable. Similarly, intermediate black holes, do they exist? Well, actually, I mean, they are certainly less certain than the, than the stellar mass black holes are, I think. And again, it will be useful to, to get measurements from, 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 from the gravitational wave detectors to see whether they exist or not. And so on, most of the stuff one can do is related to black hole physics, and most of it will be done by looking at the shapes of signals that are detected, and we'll say more about that later. But there's also quite a bit can be done about neutron stars, white dwarfs, etc. And, um, and also an interesting question is, how massive could a neutron star be? Because, I mean, although originally thoughts were that neutron stars were restricted to about you know, 1.4 solar masses or so, there's thoughts that they could maybe in fact be quite a bit heavier and that will directly fall out of gravitational wave observations. Now, do we believe they exist or not? Well, from special relativity, something's got to exist. From general relativity, we get the predictions, you know, that, that Einstein made. And it's interesting to look at the case of the binary pulsar, PSR 1913 plus 16, where you've got two neutron stars rotating around each other, one of which is a pulsar, and you can use the ticks of the pulsar to time the orbit, the rotational orbit, and watch how that orbit evolves. If you calculate from general relativity how the orbit will it should evolve, if you're losing energy by gravitational waves, you get the continuous curve there. If you measure how the orbit's evolving, you get the, the black points, and you'll see that the black points fall beautifully on the curve. And in fact, there's, there's really exceedingly good agreement between general relativity and observations, suggesting that this binary uh, neutron star system is radiating. And there's even better agreement now if you look at the case of the double pulsar, where it's two neutron stars rotating around each other. So there's very good indirect evidence for gravitational waves, but no direct evidence. And so the challenge is to really try to find directly gravitational waves and then use them to do astronomy. Now, in fact, you get you expect a gravitational radiation produced over a vast range of frequencies from about 10 to the minus 16 hertz, where from the, the microwave background experiments, you expect to see the effect of gravitational radiation on the background as ripples on the background effectively. And by measuring the bipolarization of the background, there are, there, there are good ways, in fact, to, 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 to hope to find uh, signals at this sort of frequency. If you come up the, the frequency band a bit to so 10 to the minus 8 hertz or so, it turns out that pulsars can be used as detectors, or rather the signals from pulsars coming to the Earth can be, can be affected by the gravitational waves, and you can look for phase fluctuations. And I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that later. Then as you come up the band a bit further, around about 10 to the minus 4 hertz or so, where LISA, the space-based interferometer that I'll talk about, is, uh, is, is, is proposed to fly. Um, there are many, many interesting signals in that range coming from massive black holes interacting and massive black holes being formed. And then if we come up to the audio frequency range, that's where the ground-based interferometers have been built in order to look for signals from you know, neutron star, neutron star coalescences, neutron star black hole, also supernovae. The downside or the difficulty of detecting gravitational waves is a weakness of the signal that you get from any source. And if we look now just at a typical prediction for, 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 for gravitational wave amplitude, 
from between about 10 to the minus 4 hertz here up to about 10 to the 4 hertz. The most striking thing is that all the numbers up the axis here for the amplitude really lie below about 10 to the minus 20. So you're trying to detect strains in space smaller than one part in 10 to the 20, and many things are down at the one part in 10 to the 22. If again we look at this, there, you can actually divide this spectrum into two regions with a, with a division at a few hertz. I think it's shown here at one hertz. It probably should be really at a few hertz. Above a few hertz, you can do experiments on ground looking for fluctuating gravitational effects like these fluctuating tidal effects that are caused by the ripples in space-time. Below a few hertz, you can't because there's so much else happening. There are so many gravitational, fluctuating gravitational gradients about. So in fact, you find the spectrum divides itself into a region where you can do experiments in ground and where you want to do experiments in space. In space, as I'll explain, LISA is the, the experiment that's proposed there looking for coalescences of, say, massive black holes, uh, uh, also black holes been formed, and what you find is the signals are a bit bigger there. Maybe they can even get to a massive one part in 10 to the 19, um, rather than one part in 10 to the 22, but they're still very small. And that's been the real challenge, is how to make or how to measure strains in space that are as small as this. Now the effect of a gravitational wave is, if you think of a ring of particles, is quadrupolar. A, ring, a gravitational wave coming into the plane of the board there will make a ring turn into a kind of ellipse one way, then an ellipse the other way. It's a typical quadrupole interaction. And it gives you some feeling how you could hope to measure the gravitational wave signals by somehow putting objects down that, that feel this sort of distortion. Of course, the distortions here are much bigger than you, than you ever would get in practice. And one way to do it, the way that first, in fact, people thought to make gravitational wave detectors, were to think of taking al aluminium bars, hanging them, putting them in under vacuum, so they're not affected acoustically, and isolating them from mechanical vibrations of the ground by means hanging them by wires or something like that, and looking for excitations of the normal modes. And in fact, the first experiments in this line were done by Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland. And he had aluminium bars like this. Joseph Weber, who had written the book, remember, in the early 1960s, uh, hung up a number of aluminium bars. And around the aluminium bars, he put piezoelectric transducers, kind of the sort of thing at this time you got for record players to detect you know, the motion of the needle from the record in, in, in the arm that came across onto the record. So he had many of these bonded around the middle of the bar looking for fluctuating strains. And he published this paper in 1969 claiming evidence for the discovery of gravitational radiation. He had two detectors, one in the University of Maryland, one at the Argonne National Lab, about, that's about 500 kilometers distance between them, and he found coincident excitations about once per day. <coughs> and he claimed this, that at the same time, I mean, it'd be a random time of day at first, but he would see both detectors excited at the same time. And this, in fact, was the basis for his claim. He then went on to show, in fact, that if you looked at the position of the center of the galaxy, that, and, and histogrammed the time that these came in, that it looked as if the signals were coming from the center of the galaxy. Subsequently, though, these results were shown to be false. And it is interesting that if one goes into the bookshops in Cambridge, there's a journal, a, there was a kind of astronomy journal, local astronomy inside the university journal published in Cambridge, in which Weber wrote an article. And he had this histogram in, and he showed right enough that the signals came from the galactic center once every 24 hours or once every 23 hours, whatever it is, 56 minutes or so. Martin Rees pointed out to him that gravitational waves don't get absorbed by matter. They come through the Earth, and so he should be seeing it twice per day, once every 12 hours. And lo and behold, when the journal paper appeared, it had changed to once every 12 hours. <laughs> and this caused a lot of disquiet in the community at that time as to how this change could have taken place. But nonetheless, Weber went on to claim this, 
Other people built up detectors in Glasgow. We built up, in fact, Ron Drever was in Glasgow at this stage, and we built up two aluminium bar detectors, uh, similar to Weber's, but slightly more sensitive. I was a young postdoc at that time. And in fact, we had two of these. We ran them for several years and only ever got one event that might have been a gravitational wave. Other people around the world built similar detectors and nobody saw anything that was convincing statistically. And in fact, uh, we, everyone came to the belief that Weber's results were just due to natural fluctuations that were fundamentally noise and it just was dependent on how he did the statistics of that noise. So in fact, we're in a situation where nobody was seeing anything with ground-based detectors. Weber was seeing things. People had got quite excited and wanted to go ahead. And there were two ways ahead. You could either cool the detectors to effectively remove thermal fluctuations and make these bar detectors more sensitive. And a number of groups in the world went that way. Or you could try to make the signals bigger. Because it's a strain in space, and what you tend to do is to measure displacement. You can get, measure, get bigger displacement by effectively putting masses further apart. And so the idea was to thinking again of the ring of particles here, to think of putting down, you know, two arms of an interferometer, of a Michelson interferometer, one here, one here, hanging mirrors and pendulums to isolate them from the ground and to look for changes in the interference pattern. But of course, if you're trying to measure a, a, a strain in space of about one part in 10 to the 22, even if you make these things many kilometers long, you're still talking about movements of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. And given that the wavelength of light is about 10 to the minus 6 meters, you're trying to detect things that are one, one part in 10 to the 12 of the wavelength of light. You know, so you're trying to split fringes in a Michelson to about one part in 10 to the 12. Not easy. And that's why, as yet, gravitational waves have not been detected, just because experimentally the challenge is so high. Now, you can help things a bit. These interferometers are like any antennae, really. And like any antenna, you really want the arm length to be about a quarter of a wavelength. Now, if you think you're operating at kilohertz or so, this means you've got to have your arm 75 kilometers long. To build an interferometer on Earth with arms 75 kilometers long is certainly non-trivial. To find an area of ground that's relatively flat to do that. But you can do better by, or you can help the situation by having multiple beams in the arms, or in fact by having fabby perot cavities, having resonant cavities in the arms. Because then, in fact, the, the path is folded and the movement gets magnified up. And that's pretty much the way people have gone to build things with folded arms of some sort. Although I should say in space, of course, it's not a problem to get long arm lengths. You can really get almost as long as you want. And that's the direction, as we'll see, that Lisa has gone. Now, these early interferometers, there were a number of early interferometers built up. Probably the first, in fact, was built by a student of Weber's, uh, in fact, at the Hughes Aircraft Lab, a guy called Bob Forward, who also went on to write science fiction stories, make a lot of money in that and buy a castle in Scotland. But he built this anyway, um, as a small thing. Didn't see anything with it, but it, again, it raised interest in the field. And Ray Weiss at MIT took time off his work doing info, looking at the cosmic microwave background, in fact, being, really an, being a really microwave person, to build an interferometer at MIT, just a, a, a small one, just to test some principles. And then in Glasgow, we built one. We built a 10-meter interferometer in Glasgow. Our German colleagues in Garshing built a 30-meter one. And then Ron Drever had gone to the US by this time and effectively took the ideas of the Glasgow interferometer. And because it was in the US, it had to be bigger than the two Europeans. And with a 40-meter prototype, was built, in fact, in Caltech. And of course, it was really that work in Caltech and the work in MIT that, in a sense, triggered the, the later developments because you, the US was a place where there was certainly the amount of money to get the field started properly. Now, to, if you look at interferometers of this type, I mean, something must limit the sensitivity. What are the things that limit the sensitivity? Well, first of all, you find that photons, of course, are, are lumpy in nature. Or you can think of light as being lumpy. 
And so if you have a photodetector detecting photons, you expect to get photoelectron short noise, like dropping peas onto a metal plate. It's a simplistic way to look at things, but nonetheless, it gives a reasonable picture. Similarly, when you put light into the arms of an interferometer, because of the fluctuating, fluctuating nature of the photons, they will rattle the end mirrors. And if you look at these two effects on an interferometer, it's like the Heisenberg microscope experiment. And you can show, in fact, you get a limitation. There's a certain light power which is optimum. And the limitation you get with that light power is, is the same limitation that you would get if you apply Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to each of the masses in the interferometer. So in fact, there's a limitation like this. Now, that limitation may in fact not be a true limitation and is probably bypassable as it happens by a bit of cleverness, but I'm not going to say any more about that today. But there is a limitation set by the laser power. And fundamentally, the more power you have, the smaller is the shock noise, the more is the radiation pressure noise. Now, seismic noise is clearly an issue because if, you know, if you're anywhere near a railway line or something like that and the train goes past, I mean, you know, it really shakes the ground. Even modern trains, far less steam trains, shake the ground a lot. But it turns out to be easy to isolate against seismic noise just by hanging things as pendulums. Pendulums are remarkably good at isolating things. But what's not so easy to isolate against are, is noise due to gravitational gradients, as I talked about before. And even on the Earth, if you, you know, are out in the country and you've got you know, animals running about, racing past the kind of end of your interferometer, they will in fact produce some pull on it. And as I, I said earlier, below about 10 hertz actually, you can see the effects of animals, density fluctuations above, even just straight pull due to the seismic noise in the ground, pulling in a Newtonian way in the test masses. So gravity gradient noise is an issue. And then, as you'd expect, if the systems are all at room temperature, atoms and molecules are fluctuating about in the mirrors themselves that you use and how you suspend them, and so you expect to have thermal noise. And to, to get around that, you need to have very special materials, as I'll explain later, to, to limit the amount of thermal or the effect of the thermal noise. But all these effects suggest that you want interferometers with very long arm lengths in fact. And so various projects were planned and built. In the US, the LIGO experiment, in Europe, Virgo and Geo 600, and in Japan, the TAMA experiment. Large interferometers built to look for gravitational waves. In the US, LIGO experiments, there are actually two interferometers and one vacuum system in Hanford, in the nuclear reservation in Hanford. There's a four kilometer long and a two kilometer long one inside this vacuum system. In Livingston, which is in Louisiana, there's a four kilometer interferometer. So there's two interferometer setups in the US. There is the Geo 600 interferometer, which is near Hanover. The Virgo, it's 600 meters long. There's the Virgo interferometer, which is in the Arno Valley near Pisa with three kilometer arms. And there's the Tama interferometer in, the, in Tokyo in the Astronomical Observatory, it's 300 meters. And also a test interferometer now in Japan, a low temperature test interferometer in the Kamioka mine. LIGO is big. These things are big. I mean, the, the central stations are like supermarkets in size. And I mean, there's these four kilometer arms dead flat. You know, they're actually, they're, they're, they're made to be flat. They don't follow the curvature of the Earth. So if you stand and look out, they appear to be curving upwards. It's a very strange feeling. Um, this is in the desert, uh, <coughs> an interesting desert in the middle of the nuclear reservation. And it's interesting that the tumbleweed that, that gathers tends to be a little bit radioactive because of, the, 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 of where it has come from. Louisiana is different. It's a very different environment in the swamps there, and you can see the water here, and of course, along with the water come the alligators. So again, it's a very interesting uh, detector to visit if you have an interest in wildlife. <laughs> dangerous things, alligators. I'm not going to say any more about them, but they are dangerous. Um, now, all these, de these detectors of this type, they're based on Fabry Perot interferometers in the arms. They're illuminated with infrared light, Nid-Yag light at one micron or so, and currently 
people can, are, currently they've been illuminated by about 30 watts of CW laser light. Now that's a lot of light, 30 watts of CW laser light. And later on, people hope to go up to about 200 watts. There's also a funniness in that optical diagram. You can see the interferometer. The funniness is another mirror that's placed between the laser and the interferometer. And what that does is the impedance matches the laser into the interferometer. Because if any of you remember setting up a Michelson in the lab, um, what you tend to get is you put, the laser, or you put the light in and you see fringes. Now it turns out the most sensitive place for small displacement measurements in the Michelson is very close to getting no light out in the output. That's when you get your best signal to noise ratio. In that situation, where does the light in that you, you put in go? It actually gets reflected right back out into the laser. And it tells you there's something wrong with an experiment like that. And what this extra mirror does is it arranges for some light to be reflected off the front of it that directly cancels out the light coming back. It's called a power recycling mirror. And what it means is if you put in 30 watts here, you actually can have a standing power inside the interferometer of, of 100 to 1,000 times higher than that. It's a trick to get more laser power and to get photo, photoelectron shot noise down. But an interesting trick. Building LIGO wasn't entirely smooth. Louisiana is an interesting state. It's um, a state where people are very liable to shoot you if you get onto the property. And some people felt that the LIGO detector was in the property. So they came out and they shot at it. <laughs> and it was actually possible to put, to put um, sticks back in and see where the people had been. And the local newspaper was quite interesting. They, th they thought that when it was like this, that what should happen is that LIGO should just get its laser out and shoot the people who were shooting it. <laughs> but health and safety, even in the US, doesn't allow that, sadly. <laughs> in Hanford also, it, it wasn't really any easier. In Hanford, they had the problem first of an earthquake that caused the laser beam inside the interferometer to manage to touch one of the suspension wires and to burn through a suspension wire in one of the mirrors, about 10 kilograms of fused silica fell um, due to the earthquake. Then they had a fire, and that was an interesting fire. And in fact, the, the detector, the arm length, acted as a fire break for the fire and stopped the fire going any further. Then you get the local policeman who forgets, of course, that an interferometer has been built and he's been used to driving across the desert not looking where he's going. You got it wrong that time. The geo interferometer is much smaller and much lower cost because fundamentally neither UK or Germany could afford to put out the amount of money that either the US could for LIGO or I have to say our French and Italian colleagues could for Virgo. Interesting that. Italy is an amazing country for funding science. It really does remarkably well at finding money to fund science. And so GEO is a smaller interferometer. Um, it's, 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 it's in a very nice place. I mean, it's, it's in fact on a fruit farm in Hanover, which we got from the university effectively, the free area to put it. The UK and German groups got together to build it because we couldn't really do things on our own funding wise. And GEO is somewhat cleverer than the other two. It had to be cleverer in order to be able to work with them. And for one thing, we don't use actually fabriperal cavities in the arms. We have a funny scheme where um, we look at the light out of the interferometer and reflect it back in and resonate the output signal light back inside. It's something called signal recycling. Um, it's said that because we're Scots, that any bit of light wasted was, a, was an anathema to us, and so we had to send it back in to do more work. In fact, this has worked very well, and as I'll say, it is being implemented now in all the other detectors around the world also. Um, but by this scheme and by certain other things, we were able to make the sensitivity of our own interferometer, uh, the small interferometer, very close to the bigger ones. And so this gave us a way to work successfully with them. Now, the other thing we did was, in making our pendulums, we decided not to use steel, but to use silica. If you look very carefully at the thermal displacement noise from an interferometer, what you find is, if you look at the frequency spectrum, it gets peaked at the pendulum resonance, say around about one hertz, 
and let's say at the first internal resonance of the test mass. So the thermal fluctuations peak there. And typically one wants to look for gravitational waves between these uh, peaks. So what you want is that the noise level here to be as low as possible. That means you want the peaks to be as narrow as possible or you want to be using material that has got particularly low mechanical loss, that's got particularly high mechanical Q and rings very well. Now it's well known, I mean you'll know yourself from you know, using an ordinary tumbler to go into a whiskey glass, a whiskey glass rings much better than a tumbler. Well a silica glass rings even better still. And fused silica is one of the best materials, in fact, for mechanical Q that you can get. You can get silica with mechanical Q of about 10 to the 8 or so, which is very high. So we decided we wanted to, to make everything of silica. And so we decided to hang things on silica fibers, developed a special jointing technique, silica to silica, to make a quasi-monolithic suspension. Everyone told us we were crazy that silica fibers would never take the weight involved. It's about 10 kilos or so in the bottom here. In fact, it worked beautifully. Once it went into vacuum, the silica has worked beautifully. And so these ultra-low mechanical loss suspensions are really at the heart of our interferometer. Uh, somehow, uh, yeah, there we are. And as I'll say later, at the heart now of all the other interferometers that are currently being upgraded. Now that's for the ground. What about space? Well, back in the 1980s, some people in Boulder were very keen to make a space interferometer, to build a space interferometer, in particular Pete Bender from, the, from Jilla in Boulder. And in fact, it turned out that the US were not so keen on the idea at the time. And what then happened was that the idea moved to Europe, I mean, collaborating with Pete Bender. And um, there were groups both in Germany, Italy, and the UK who got interested to build an interferometer um, to really to study black hole physics in this low frequency range, so about 10 to the minus 4 hertz to 10 to the minus 1 hertz. And the idea at first was to fly six spacecraft, kind of two at each corner of a triangle. And we put forward a proposal, uh, and to the M, it was an M3 proposal to ESA in about 1993 for this. And after a bit of a negotiation, Lisa was actually selected as an ESA Cornerstone mission in 95. And then the design evolved to its present design of kind of three, just three spacecraft in a triangle. And that baseline concept has remained since then. The baseline's long, it's five million kilometers, the baseline for Lisa. And the idea is that effectively, the three corners of the triangle there would be test masses inside and laser beams shone between the test masses. And then by phase comparison of these laser beams, one would look for distortion of the triangle as might be caused by the gravitational waves. Of course, you've always got worries about, um, about things in space. There's other objects about that can come and hit what you want to have up there inside your spacecraft. So you've got to put a you've got to have a very carefully designed spacecraft to put round these test masses or these mirrors and they've got to be such that these are effectively drag free spacecraft that is the spacecraft it, 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 its distance from the test masses is measured and if something comes from the outside and hits it hard so it moves that is sensed and thrusters on the craft pull it back again so effectively, this drag-free technology protects what is inside, leaves that undisturbed. And that is essential for LISA. And the idea for LISA is to fly three of these, uh, or to have three of these um, satellites in an orbit about the Earth, uh, about one, uh, one AU in fact, the same distance as the Earth is from the Sun, about 20 degrees behind the Sun, and to set them individually out in an orbit, you, you, set each of the, you set each of the spacecraft out individually into their own orbit. And lo and behold, with no connection between them, a year later, they're back in the same orientation. So this needs very careful choice of orbit to do that. But in fact, the, the orbits are calculable and they're expected to, to work rather well. 
Now, as I said, the science of LISA is mainly to look at things like massive black hole binaries, ultra compact binaries, these extreme mass ratio in spirals where you've got a very small black hole spiraling into a much larger black hole with a very extreme orbit. And also, you expect there to be a cosmic background, in fact, due to this. And, I mean, Graziella here has interests in parts of the LISA experiment, in fact. At lower frequencies than LISA is where we expect to be able to use pulsars. And the idea is, again, just the same, that if you imagine the ring of particles has been distorted, and imagine that you're looking out to pulsars kind of in different directions, that, in fact, the apparent distance, you might say, to the pulsar would appear to change, although that's not really the right way to look at it. But you expect, in fact, to get a tidal phase change on the signal coming in from the pulsar. LISA has come on a long way, and in fact, LISA Pathfinder, that's, now, LISA Pathfinder is a single satellite experiment to check or to, to try out the drag three principles and, and part of the interferometry. LISA Pathfinder is due to launch in 2012. As I said, the pulsar timing lot are, are really getting, on, getting their act together very strongly. And the other thing that many of us have learned over the last few years is that what we want to do is be part of a multi-messenger astronomy community. We're not just interested in detecting gravitational waves or looking at gravitational waves for their own reasons. We'd like to be part of the astronomical community and do look for joint measurements, you know, look for measurements with the neutrino people, look for, do observations with the optical people and the radio people. As much more information can we've got if we put all the information together. Now, just to show you how things have progressed, this just shows the sensitivity of the LIGO experiment. The, the solid curve there was the prediction, or was the, was the kind of um, aim for LIGO. The, 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 the wiggly colored curves show the actual performance of LIGO. And you'll see how close LIGO got to its, or has got to its design sensitivity with strains of the right kind of order, one part in 10 to the minus 22 or so, you know, around about 100 hertz. So LIGO's been quite remarkable. LISA has also been developed, as I said, because LISA Pathfinder is underway, or the, um, the developments for it, to test the interferometry here with two test masses placed like this and a jag fee satellite roundabout. And in fact, in Glasgow, we are building the optical benches for LISA Pathfinder. There are three benches been built and they're just in the point of delivery now. They're just in the point of leaving the lab in Glasgow to go to be integrated into the spacecraft, which is currently, uh, uh, I think they go to Germany first, then come back to the, to the spacecraft, which was, is currently at Astrium in Stevenage. Now, where have we got to with these initial ground-based interferometers? Well, we've completed quite a set of science runs. About five science runs have been completed. And these science runs have set limits on coalescing binary systems, on bursts, on the cosmic gravitational wave background, and on continuous wave sources. And just to, to show you uh, just a few examples of these, for the Crab Pulsar, for example, we are now able to show that the slowdown rate of the Crab Pulsar cannot be due to gravitational waves. In fact, um, the gravitational the, the, up, the energy limit radiated in gravitational waves has to be smaller than 2% of the total energy radiated by the crab in its slowdown. And that's quite a useful and interesting figure. We're able also to show that the upper limit, the electricity, is about 1 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, I should say for some other pulsars, we can show that the electricity is down about 1 in 10 to the 8. <clears throat> and if you think of a pulsar, with a radio that is, whose kind of diameter is maybe 10 kilometers. That means that we're able to say that bumps in some pulsars are smaller than a millimeter, in fact, of the order of a tenth of a millimeter. And this begins to set some very useful constraints on the solid state physics of neutron star material. So not a direct detection, but the beginnings of astrophysics. Similarly, there was a very interesting gamma ray burst, in fact, thought to be an M31, if I remember right, and thought to be about 800 kiloparsecs away. It was a fast gamma ray burst. So one might have thought it was a neutron star black hole coalescence. 
But if it had been a neutron star black hole coalescence, we'd have seen it with the gravity wave detectors, and we didn't. So the net conclusion of that is it wasn't, in fact, a gamma ray burst, but was, in fact, a soft gamma ray repeater. But one of these days, there will be a gamma ray burst that's close enough, and we'll see that. Similarly, we've been able to set a limit on the stochastic background, and in fact, this made nature the limit we set on the background at around about 100 hertz of, of 9 times 10 to the minus 6 of the closure density. It's not fantastic that it begins to set some constraints on inflation, but one of the interesting things is that Mike Turner in, in, this, in, in Nature said that for 40 years, these gravity wave people have been, have been uh, claiming that a detection was just round the corner. And at last, he believes that they might actually be right. So we're hoping he is right. Now, what's going on just now is, that having done initial runs, we're actually upgrading LIGO and Virgo. We have upgraded them by a factor of two, and we've, set we've started new science runs. And they will run through to the summer, and the data can be analyzed from them. And then soon after that, round about October for LIGO, in fact, LIGO is going to be taken apart. And fundamentally, the geotechnology has been put into LIGO. The fused silica suspensions are going into LIGO. The, the, the signal recycling is going into LIGO to get about a factor of 10 to 15 improvement. It's interesting that our Virgo colleagues, in fact, already are putting fused silica, silica into Virgo. Their enhanced detector will have fused silica in it very soon. They're stopping to upgrade the fused silica at the minute, in fact. Um, and so we're seeing the geotechnology being, in fact, applied to both or to both and both of the bigger detector sites. And in geo, we're going to do a little bit of upgrading, really at the high frequency end, to make a slightly better geo detector. Now, just for comparison, to let you, you realize how, how signals look, for the initial detectors for neutron star and neutron star binaries, we could expect to see out to 15 megaparsecs and maybe have a rate of one per 50 years. With the advanced detectors like this, we expect to see out to 200 megaparsecs and be able to see things at a rate of about 40 per year. Similarly, for black hole, black hole binaries, Currently, it's about one per hundred years. With the advanced detectors here, we expect to go up to 20 a year. So it's a real way forward. And as I say, advanced LIGO is really based on the geotechnology. Um, we in Glasgow have been developing the fused silica suspensions for that. Colleagues in RAL and Birmingham developing other parts of the suspension. And we do have big 20 kilogram mirrors hanging in fused silica fibers at the minute, testing out for advanced LIGO. Our German colleagues are providing a 200 watt laser for this, and our US colleagues are providing active isolation <coughs> systems to help the vibra you know, ground, to help guard against ground vibrations. Now, we'll have these detectors running together from about 2014, and that's the point we can almost guarantee we'll make discoveries of gravitational waves and see things. But we would like to be able to to be more precise at determining where signals are in the sky. And with the initial detectors, that's the advanced LIGO, advanced Virgo, and geo detectors. If you look at the kind of resolution in the sky, there are directions where, in fact, it's very crude. To make it better and get really good precision, we need detectors in other parts of the world. And in fact, there's a proposal now to build a, a, a machine in the Kamioka mine. It's called LCGT, the Large Cryogenic Gravitational Telescope. It's up for funding just now in Japan. It's looking quite likely, actually, it will be funded quite soon. And just for fun and to be ahead of the rest of us, they're making it low temperature cryogenic. It will have about the same sensitivity as the other advanced detectors, but it's interesting to see the cryogenic technology come in. And also in Australia, there are plans progressing to have a detector in Australia. And it is possible, in fact, although it's not agreed yet, but there is a, quite a high probability that, in fact, that one of the LIGO detectors will actually be built in Australia. That instead of having three detectors, as currently there are in the US, 
they may go down to two detectors and actually let that third detector go down to Australia if our Australian colleagues can provide enough money to build up some infrastructure for it. Now, in fact, all this is pretty much underway. This will allow observation of gravitational waves in the beginning of astronomy. But in fact, probably we've got to do, go further to a real astronomy introduced. And so already thoughts are looking towards how to make better detectors still. Because it's time to start R&D and the next generation of detectors, the third generation of detectors. Now these third generation detectors will not come about, of course, if we don't see something with the advanced detectors. Because as Lord Kelvin, my patron, kind of says, you know, large increases in cost with questionable increases in performance can be tolerated only in race horses and in something else. But I'll let you look up the rest of the quotation yourself. It's not very PC these days. I think when Kelvin was about, you could say things that you can't say nowadays. So in fact, in Europe, we, are, we have a design study to, build, to design a, an underground detector to work at low temperature. And it will be triangular probably in shape, a little bit like LISA, with mirrors here underground and lasers running you know, between the underground mirrors. But in fact, the final design and the final cost is not yet, has not yet been derived. The goal, though, is to have something that's 100 times better than the first generation of detectors. Now, remember, it's a strain in space you're trying to see. So 100 times better in sensitivity means you see 100 times further out, or you see 100 cubed times the volume. So the volume goes up by a million. And so therefore, source rates should rise just enormously. That's just to give some impression of how sensitivities have evolved. Initial detectors are kind of here. Advanced detectors are here in frequency, you know, running between above 10 hertz to about a kilohertz. The third generation detector, known as the Einstein telescope, hopefully will run from well below 10 hertz to about 10 kilohertz with a significant improvement in sensitivity. Time scales, people are interested in. Usually, well, if we look at LISA, LISA is expected to launch about 2020. And these third generation detectors is expected to cut in on the same kind of time scale, probably, in fact, not being properly operational till about, the 10, 10, about, till about 2023. Meanwhile, the advanced detectors should be starting to run about 2014 or so. will run through perhaps to about 2019. And then they themselves are upgradable at that point to run with both LISA and the third generation of detectors. So what we're heading to is quite a number of gravitational wave detectors really around the world. A whole network, LISA in space, at least for a while, it won't, it, it's difficult to say how long the lifetime of LISA could be. It might be 10 years, though. Certainly should be five years. And with a whole series of ground-based detectors running. The aim being, of course, to really start gravitational wave astronomy proper. And whereas almost all other fields of astronomy, there have been a lot of discoveries, unexpected discoveries. We expect that the same will be true of gravitational wave astronomy, that once we've seen the sort of things we expect to see, there will be lots more there to be excited about. But we'll just have to wait for that point to see. Thank you very much. To find out more about UCL, please visit us at itunes.ucl.ac.uk.